Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Mr. President, Chancellor, I'm sorry, we're still not in the coffee break and we are 10 minutes late. So <laughs> I'm going to hope I, I still have half an hour and that will make you even more thirsty for coffee. Anyhow, I'm going to talk about uh, climate change science. Uh, <clears throat> And if, if I may, I'm going to expand the title of my talk a, a, a little bit in that it's, uh, I could also have labeled it uh, climate change science and society since it's, this is an issue that affects society and there seems to be a lot of controversy. So that's the sort of thing I'm going to try to, to uh, address. So let me see what I can get started here. Oh, I have to turn it on. Okay. Okay, should be on now. There we go. Um, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, other to point out that the, the climate system, uh, rather than complex, I would say it's complicated. It has all sorts of... Uh, factors that uh, need to be considered to understand uh, climate because our planet is large and there are many uh, elements that affect climate, physical, biological, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but that's not necessarily what we they call complexity. In fact, one example of complexity we saw already yesterday in the introductory lectures has to do more uh, with weather rather than climate. Let me just remind you the difference between weather and climate. Climate is a collection of a sort of average weather over a, an extended period of time, several years, perhaps a decade. Uh, with weather, in fact, one, with the example I'm most familiar with, with the complexity perhaps that's normally understood, it is, has to do with chaos. I, having taught many years at MIT, Ed Lawrence was a good friend. He was a neighbor of mine. As you know, he passed away several years ago. But he used to tell us stories how he came up with his ideas, how he coined the word chaos. Okay. But it was basically looking at a, a, a set of very simple differential equations. They just happened to be nonlinear and the results extremely sensitive to initial conditions to the extent that uh, he, he discovered that almost by, uh, by chance that he was getting different results depending on how he rounded up the initial conditions. And that's what gives rise to phenomena that are known such as the butterfly effect and so on. But in, in, uh, in climate, we don't have to deal with these uh, complexities. We're dealing with averages. Perhaps the most uh, complex or I would say complicated uh, portion of of, uh, of the climate issue is not the science itself, but it is the way society perceives it. Okay. So I'm, I'll, since it's a topic that is important for society, I'm going to start by spending a few minutes just reviewing what you probably all know. But I have here some data from some, some surveys which are now a few years old. Things have changed. These are surveys in the United States and it's the way the media depicts the science of climate change. And what is very clear is, that, 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 but there are many indications of this, is that the, there is a very clear scientific consensus uh, as to what, what we call the scientific evidence. And to start with, I, I want to clarify, that doesn't mean that scientists are certain about climate change. They are just convinced that what society is doing to the climate is something that something connected with a significant level of risk. That's it. It doesn't mean by any means that it's that, that they know with certainty how climate will behave depending on what, what human activity do. But there is, as you see, there's a 97% consensus. The national academies, professional societies, they all agree with this. I would actually add that the three percent. There are a handle, uh, uh, just a, a few scientists that sort of doubt that the seriousness of this 
and we actually know them very well. Perhaps the best known one is Dick Linson, who was also a neighbor of mine at MIT, so I know him very well, and I think I know where he actually goes wrong. I think he's making some mistakes, actually, but not, not that, again, not that we think we know things with certainty, but he underestimates the, 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 the risk itself. All right, well, but here is a problem, at least in the United States, and again, this is not science, this is connected with the uh, efforts of uh, some public interest groups that financed a, a, a very well-planned well public relations campaign. And they managed to work, to, to have a very big impact with uh, the media. Because the media bought this idea that there are two sides of this issue. There are those who agree and those who don't agree. And so, because of that, again, this has changed now, but just a few years ago, the, the uh, more than half, 70% of the TV ads thought that there was no consensus. Okay, so it's a very striking difference with the, what the actual consensus is. And here I put myself doing some reading about some other surveys. There's, there is also a 20, 30%, I think it's 20 is a more accurate number of citizens in the United States who believe in astrology and yet the media doesn't always tell you, well, we think the economic school did us at this or that. However, the stars tells us that it will happen this or this other way with, with comparable statistics. Okay. Fortunately, that's not the case, but it is the case with climate somehow or other. And this is reflected, of course, with the public. The public also, just like the media, a few years ago were, were seriously doubting that this, the seriousness of uh, climate change and there were all sorts of uh, views ranging from the more extreme ones associated with things like the Tea Party movement of the, the Republican Party, which this is all just a hoax that scientists just wanted more money or so. Of course, all the way to the to the three percent of the scientists that I just talked about that are experts in climate change science, but who question that it, it's as serious as. as most of us think it is, okay. So anyhow, this, this is now changing, particularly because of extreme events. If I have a chance, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But there is some, whoops. Unfortunately, this, my slides are all white, and uh, so uh, they are not showing. I wonder if you could just put the presentation just like I have it, or, or show my, <laughs> my uh, this is a big surprise. I have my presentation here, we connect the computer, otherwise the bulk of it is gonna to be totally black. Could you tell me what you did to change the color? And if you could, uh, can you, uh, sir? Hello? Yeah, yeah, can you make it the original presentation, not change the color? Because otherwise I will just ignore my presentation and just tell you about it. I don't know what you did. <laughs> but it, we seem to have a, a very complex technical problem even, even with the most simple presentations. <laughs> but I will keep going just in case if you can, because otherwise we can use my computer. It, it's, I've shown several hundred presentations in the last year or so and this has never happened before. Anyhow, let me continue. Uh, I had, uh, no, I, we have to go back. Let me see if I can do it. No, they, what? It, is, is this a Windows uh, computer or you change to a Mac? Well, sorry, I, I'm, I'm just going to talk about it then. This slide is an article from the Wall Street Journal that uh, quotes, and I'm going to have to read it from my own graph here. Sorry for the delay, I'll try to catch up now. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll just read it to you. The title says, no need to panic about global warming. This is an article that showed up in the Wall Street Journal. And the point I'm trying to, sh to 
to do next, just to finish with this public perception about science, is one is what happens to the public, but what is to me very striking is that the scientific community itself is questioning this issue uh, in, in a very strange way, but it's not the community of experts. So there, there, there was this article in the Wall Street Journal with about 60 scientists signing the article, again the title saying, no need to panic about global warming. Professor. Of those 65. <coughs> sorry, sorry, Professor. Yes. We, we can, we need one moment, one minute, and, and we change the computer because okay. this is not. Okay, okay. I will keep talking. There we okay. go. It's very easy. Thank now. you. The mouse. Sorry? Yeah, I, I. So can I keep commenting without touching things? They or? will only change the computer. Okay, pretty good. One more. So I'll keep talking. <laughs> Anyhow, there is, this is the, if I no. can, no, I won't do anything. This is the next okay. slide, but the previous one, oh, okay, now we're in business. Sorry about this delay. Uh, okay. I can push it yes, now myself? Yes, yes. Yes. Very good. Great. Now we go to, whoops. There we go. Okay. So this is, this is what I was just reading to you. There's no need to, to panic. And they quote a colleague of ours who got his information just from the web, but he has no idea whatsoever what climate change is all about. And the other 65 scientists I, I mentioned, Dick Linson is one of them but the rest are not climate scientists. So, but they questioned it because they bought the results of this public relations campaign, perhaps. And so what the scientific community did is respond. And I won't go through the details, but the, but the, the response is, look, if, if, if you, let's make an analogy if you have a heart problem and you're worried about your health, you don't go and ask your dentist. You go and ask your cardiologist. Okay? And I would add something. If I have a heart problem and I go and ask my dentist, he's a very sensible guy. He would tell me, please go and see your cardiologist. <laughs> but that's, that's not what this scientist is. It, it's amazing. The, it, the, uh, the lack of information that these people have. To me, that's irresponsible not to do some homework at least and, and to, with, with some level of, of uh, uh, sort of uh, scientific scrutiny, make statements that are validated either by publications or, or at least you, you rationalize the statements. Anyhow, this, this is just the background. I, I moved a little bit slow, but the background is so that I can do the following. I, I'm going to, in the next few slides, try to explain how the basic science of climate is really not very complicated, okay? That's something one can explain to people, even if they are not scientists, in relatively simple terms. But the details are very complicated indeed, and, and we, we all acknowledge that. So here, here is one way, let, in the next five minutes, bear with me. Imagine I'm talking to the public, not to, to scientists like yourselves, but I, here's what I would say. Look, the planet photographs I show us, the, our blue planet, but the atmosphere, you can't even see it because it's very thin. It's like the skin of an apple. It's just very vulnerable. All you can see is the clouds. And movements bring emissions, for example, methane, carbon dioxide that remain sometime, years or even centuries, they move them around in such a way that it doesn't matter where you have these emissions, and that's why we have a global problem. It's truly global because it's independent of the place where the emissions are made. Now, what is, how, how does the climate of a planet function? And so here we go back to our planet. And it's, the, the understanding is relatively simple. We have um, what we call a steady state or, or thermal equilibrium. The planet was born very hot, and so it lost a lot of energy at the beginning, but 
not, not indefinitely, at some point in time, many millions of years ago already, it, uh, on the average, the planet started to lose the same amount of energy it was receiving from the sun. And that's this very simple uh, thermal equilibrium we're talking about. So it's in balance. It receives the same amount it loses. But of course, we know from this graph it receives its energy from the sun, mostly uh, visible light, and it emits in the infrared. And what describes this, this balance in detail? Well, it's nothing else but Planck's distribution law. So this is a very well-established law. There's really no question about that. That's what gave born to quantum mechanics, which is indeed complex, but we don't need to dwell into that. It's just that the physics is very well understood, and so is, of course, uh, Einstein's uh, uh, thermoelectric effect. That's what got him the Nobel Prize. Planck, of course, also got the Nobel Prize for his equation, uh, quantum mechanics being born. And the bottom line is that the energy lost by a planet or by a black body is, is very sensitive to, to its temperature, okay? But if we apply this simple equation and we measure the energy that arrives to our planet from the sun, we calculate that its average surface temper temperature should be minus 30, sorry, minus 18 degrees Celsius. Fortunately, that's wrong. We wouldn't be here otherwise because the planets would be frozen. So what's the, the problem? And the problem is that, that Simple calculation doesn't take into account that there's an atmosphere and that the atmosphere has a certain amount of gases that absorb the infrared radiation emitted by the surface. And so, in very simple terms, the, this very thin atmosphere ends up functioning like a blanket in that it warms the surface so that the average temperature is plus 15 and not minus 18. And this follows from very simple consideration as well as detailed radiation calculations. This is something we as physical chemists, if you want, we can measure the spectra in the infrared with great precision, better than we can calculate that with quantum mechanics. We can do that for carbon dioxide, methane, and all, all the greenhouse gases. But there's another puzzle here that is also interesting to explain, which is if we, if we look, we do these calculations, uh, first of all, it, it, it's a simple observation is that the bulk of the atmosphere wouldn't do this because oxygen and nitrogen are transparent. So the, a planet with a very clean atmosphere would still be frozen at mi minus 18. So it's the trace gases that do it. And which one is the one that absorbs most? Well, it's water vapor. It just absorbs roughly two thirds or one, uh, uh, yeah, roughly two thirds of the infrared radiation emitted by the surface. So one could argue, well, the climate is essentially determined by the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And that's, we shouldn't worry that much about carbon dioxide or the other gases, but that's the, that's the wrong perception. Because the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is determined by the hydrological cycle. Okay. And the hydrological cycle, just tell you, all well, of you know that it's in very simple terms, is the amount of water vapor depends on how much water evaporates, and how much condenses, and the, as you go higher up in the atmosphere, it gets colder, so the water vapor condenses, you get rain, snow, and so on. And so the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is very sensitive to the average temperature. And that just means the following, that it, if we do a simple thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment, if you were to remove carbon dioxide and the non-condensable greenhouse gases, that is the gases other than water vapor. Water vapor, because the planet would cool as much as uh, possibly 10, 20 degrees, water vapor would begin to condense and hence the infrared absorption would decrease and this keeps going. It's of course, it's a simple feedback loop. And so the bulk of the water vapor would condense and you would get the frozen planet even below the minus 18 that I told you about because you would get a lot of snow and ice that would reflect a larger portion of the solar radiation coming into the planet. You know roughly one third is reflected by clouds and snow and two thirds are absorbed by the surface. So the bottom line of this very simple analysis, it, it's the non-condensable greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide being the most important, but methane, tropospheric ozone, CFCs, nitrous oxide, there are a few others. 
those are the ones that are responsible for this 33 temperature difference. This is the natural greenhouse effect. So what we have is that about uh, uh, half a tenth of 1% of the composition of, of the atmosphere is what determines our climate. And that's why it's very vulnerable, the planet, because it's a minor fraction of the gases in the planet that that uh, are essentially responsible for its temperature. If I had time, this is very well supported by paleoclimate observations and so on. In, in the past, of course, climate has changed, and we know it's not just the greenhouse gases, there are other factors. If the solar uh, intensity, the energy coming from the sun changes over a period of time with 11 year cycle, so that affects the climate, but you can compute that, and nowadays that's a relatively minor effect. No? But in the past also orbital variations, the ellipticity, the eccentricity, is what has triggered the ice ages. But you can only explain them if you add the feedback from these uh, greenhouse gases. So that, that's how climate works. In detail, of course, it might be complicated, but the other point I really want to stress here when we talk about complexity, simplicity, is that we can do analysis in scientific terms at different levels. It's not wise and it's often misunderstood that we, what we know about climate comes from very complicated models that are not trustful. Of course, the very complicated models built in all sorts of details, but they are uh, supported by simpler and simpler models until you get to this very simple picture I'm giving you. So the whole thing makes sense from basic physics. At this stage, we add just this information. What has happened to carbon dioxide, the thermostat of the planet? And we know that since the Industrial Revolution, it's uh, increased about 40%. So it's, there's clearly more carbon dioxide now than in the last half a million years and possibly several million years. Well, that's already striking information if you understand this simple way the climate works. At the very least, we should worry about it. Now let's do more detailed analysis and see what's happening and so on. But these are measurements. This, there's no climate model here. Chemistry, of course, is here. And you'll analyze air bubbles trapped in, in ice cores, and you can go back half a million years doing that. Uh, and what, another set of measurements is temperature. By the way, this has also been questioned a lot by skeptics, but temp temperature measurements are very well documented. They are not trivial because you need to do very careful statistics. And the result is that temperature has increased since the Industrial Revolution, but particularly since the, the second half of last year. Temperature has increased by 0 0.7, 0 0.8 degrees, which looks very small, but that can be very well measured considering the amount of thermometers there are. And going back in time, it's more uh, sort of uh, complicated, but you can look at the widths of tree rings and so on. So there, there's a lot of scientific literature documenting this in great length. And then there is uh, for those people, if you want, even scientists that are not experts, one way to look at this, well, look, you have to read what do the experts think? What is the consensus? And one way the consensus is represented is by this group of several thousand scientists in the IPCC that just get together to examine the literature. And they are very open. You can send comments and eventually they publish reports about every five years. And they do attribution studies. And yes, the, their conclusion is that this temperature change is indeed connected with the composition change. But they're not sure about that. All we can tell is that there's, they summarize this, that there's a mere 90% probability that that's the case. But conceivably, climate has changed by chance. It's just very unlikely. Okay. I think I will end with time. OK. What are the, the uncertainties? Of course, the, the, the climate is complicated. So clouds are perhaps the, the largest uncertainty at the moment because the physics and the chemistry of clouds is complicated. And people, I think, Linson would argue there's a very strong feedback effect so that if the temperature were to increase because of CO2, the clouds would change in such a way as to keep the temperature essentially changing very little. But 
that's not the consensus of the experts of the climate models as well as of observations that there's no doubt that that the climate is changing that they, almost everybody in the planet is now aware that the climate is indeed changing now is it natural well that is possible it's just very unlikely so 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 far is 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 uh, climate science if you want how it's perceived by the public and so very rapidly what i want to show is two more things. What do the skeptics, what do some of the scientists tell us that, the, that, that things are wrong? They, they consider climate science like a, a deck of cards. So they look very hard for something, some data that they mine, that's one way to look at it, or cherry picking, or something wrong with, with uh, that. Of course, climate is so complicated, there's no doubt that there are many more details that remain to be understood. But their claim is, look, remove a card and the whole business falls apart. But that's not the way science works and most of you know that from other places. So a better analogy and I remind you, I'm, I'm talk, this is the way I talk to the public, okay? This is how science works. We have many pieces of the puzzle that are still missing and some others might even be misplaced. But you get the picture. This is not a little kitten, okay? You can probably look at this that way. So that, that's, why does it matter? Because this is one, I insist, one domain where we need to be able to communicate to the public scientific results. A different thing is to tell to the public what to do. That, I, I, that's not something that we can do as scientists, but we can do that as individuals. Now I'm gonna move very fast because there are things that are happening already. The frequency of floods is increasing. Uh, let me see if I can move this. The, there are the wildfires, the frequency of wildfires is increasing. And so the point is that extreme weather events are happening more and more often. And the scientific community, just a year ago, they were very reluctant to make any statements connecting these extreme weather. But in, in the last year, several papers already showed up making at, at attribution studies. It, it, it's, you cannot answer the question, is this particular extreme event caused by climate change? That's a wrong question because you need a lot of statistics. What you can tell is it's likely that because of the temperature change, some events like this drought in southern Texas, is, it just happened more with more intensity. It would have happened anyhow, but the intensity clearly went up. Not everything goes this way. There's a, a flooding in, in Thailand that had nothing to do with climate change, so sometimes it, uh, you can tell that. But here's another very simple interpretation, just from measurements. This is from my colleague Jim Hansen. He looks at summer temperatures as measured by satellite. No climate model here. And the uh, Gaussian looking curves keep shifting to the right. So that what uh, half a century ago, a few decades ago, was a three sigma uh, mm -hmm extreme event, a, a, a hot summer, okay. That three sigma now is no longer three sigma, just one sigma. So the probability of extreme events that were three sigma away from the average has increased about 40 or 50 times. It's just simple statistics, okay. And it's happening, you can already measure this sort of thing. This, by the way, is important because it's beginning to change the public perception of climate change. It's no longer just something that might happen at the end of the century. It's already happening, okay? Okay, so let's move on very fast. Let me just see how we're doing with, with the time. I think I need to finish very fast, but that, here's what I'll do. Uh, the next topic is, is goes beyond pure climate science, and this is what should society do? I insist this is no longer uh, what scientists should uh, tell society as scientists. What they can do is they tell this is what would happen if you do this or that, but more than 120 heads of state agree that it would be reasonable to keep the temperature to, uh, uh, from increasing more than two degrees on the surface, and that requires lots of actions, reducing emissions very dramatically just in, in a decade or so, 50%. Since we depend so much on fossil fuels, this looks uh, uh, ex extraordinarily difficult. However, the solution is there. Again, energy experts, these are also scientists if you want, they've looked, is it 
at all conceivable to solve it, sure. As long as you take many measures simultaneously, using energy more efficiently in the transportation sector and, and so on. So it, can, it certainly can be done. And what is, I want to go through the details, but there are alternatives, but energy efficiency is certainly the cheapest way to start because it, it, it gives you uh, uh, a gain economically. But eventually you have to put the price on emissions. Again, this is not science, this is now policy, but you have to do more research. This goes back to science because the price of technologies keep dropping. Solar panels have dropped uh, tremendously in price, okay? And you can do win-win measures, but let me short, sort of show you, perhaps I'll finish with this figure here. Let me just see what we have. Uh, yeah, which is from my colleagues at MIT from the joint program. Since I was so many years at MIT working with this group, I'll using it from Prin and colleagues. And it's like if we're playing a, a game of roulette because science is uncertain. So this is what science can tell us. If society continues to, to have emissions associated with fossil fuel uh, use, the way we're doing it without taking these fairly drastic measures, we are on the roulette of the left, so the temperature will most likely change more than four degrees it's even possible that we will change six degrees and that would be extraordinary. That means a very different planet already. But we can change roulette if we take the measures that I just talked about. And here's another branch of knowledge that comes in. That's the economists. How much does this cost? Is this crazy? Well, the surprising result is that the cost is of the order of one, maybe 2% of global GDP. So it, it's actually a bargain, okay? It doesn't cost very much, it, and the cost is clearly less than the cost of the damage we're already seeing, namely floods and droughts and so on. So it, it's sensible for society to do that on the recommendation of scientists in terms of what would happen if you do this or not, and on recommendation of engineers, energy experts in terms of what's feasible, and certainly from the perspective of the economists that would tell you how much it costs. But I'll finish with this one. If you look at, at a more reasonable economic analysis, they think we shouldn't even look at the average, what's most likely to happen, but we should look at that 20, 30% probability that we will have catastrophes, the red zone. That means it's possible that the Amazon forest will just disappear. The Arctic ice is already gone. So that from an economic analysis, the fat tail analysis sort of that's a, related to what insurance does, it, it just uh, doesn't make sense for the only planet that we have to take such enormous risks, 20, 30% of huge catastrophes that would make it very difficult for the developing world to continue to develop and so on because they are the more vulnerable, particularly if the cost is quite manageable, it's just politically very difficult to do at the moment. And in fact, right now, something is happening in the United States that will have a, a fairly significant impact into international uh, agreements, as you know, because the new president is involved. And it, at the moment, no international agreement is in sight because the Congress in the United States with the Republican Party in charge is just not likely to approve an international agreement but who knows, I'm optimistic things might change and we might in fact move away from the age of astrology and perhaps we will indeed solve the problem with the help from the scientific community. Thank you for your attention.